All right. Uh, in the first problem, we're going to go through uh, each of the five problems in this one video, uh, and I'll slowly reveal each of the parts and talk about them in general. Uh, hopefully, it will be pretty short and concise, but still provide you with enough information to uh, access and um, be successful on the problems that you're working on. Okay, uh, so the very first problem talks about uh, the function y equals cosine of x on the interval from 0 uh, to pi over 2 in the first quadrant. And so uh, it's asking you to take that region bounded by the x-axis, the y-axis, and within that region, and uh, rotate it around the x-axis and use that then uh, the method of washers to determine the volume generated by that rotation of that area. Okay, uh, so that's kind of what this is stating. And this is the, the picture. Uh, I usually start with a picture. Um, I think it's really helpful to graph to graph that region. And so uh, we're rotating this along, along the y equals zero or the x-axis line. So it's generating this kind of like bull looking shape. It almost looks like the, the tip of a bullet maybe. Um, and so uh, to determine the volume, then we know that the method of washers, when it doesn't have a lower radius, uh, is pi r squared, which is really the method of disks, if you're more familiar with that. Uh, and so we have pi, the radius for situation is the height of our function, which is cosine of x squared. And a note on that, to be able to integrate cosine squared, uh, you'll see in the movement from this line to this line, I've used the power reduction formula, uh, which is this, cosine squared of x is equal to 1 half, or 1 plus cosine 2x over 2. Don't forget the 2x, that's a commonly a missed um, problem or where someone can go wrong in integrating these, okay? All right, so if we plug that back in, then we have pi over two, that's the pi here. The pi over two is coming from the one half in the reduction formula. Okay, so pi over two, one plus cosine two x. And so this is what we're gonna integrate over the over the, the region of the area bounded, the bounded region uh, from zero to pi over two. Okay, uh, so plugging that in, uh, we get the volume of pi over two coming from here, going from zero to pi over two because that's our, that's our region. Uh, 1 plus cosine 2x. So the integral of, of uh, 1 is just x, that's pretty easy, and the integral of cosine is pretty easy, that the antiderivative is sine of x. Um, we have a factor of 2 to worry about, so the way I usually do these, uh, with enough practice you'll get here too, is if I take this function and I take the derivative, do I get this thing back? And so the derivative of sine is cosine, by the chain rule you get a 2 coming out uh, from the 2x, which would then cancel with the one half, which would give us back this. So this is the correct antiderivative. Okay, and so then we can plug in our limits of integration from zero to pi over two. For sine, uh, the for sine, the pi over two and the one half, or the pi over two and the two x here, that's going to give us sine of pi, which is going to give us zero, and sine of zero is also zero. So this this term actually contributes nothing to the overall integral or to the overall value, and so we're left with just the upper limit of integration on the x term, the zero canceling out. And so you're just left with pi over two times pi over two, which gives us then the value of pi over four squared. Sorry, pi squared over four. It's actually pi over two quantity squared if I wanted to write it that way. Okay, uh, in part B of this problem, it goes on a little bit more, um, and so it's saying that it wants the the line um, to rotate the same function, but around the vertical line. Well, I said y equals one half here. In the problem, it was x equals uh, x equals pi. That was my bad. Let me just verify that real quick. Yeah, yeah. In the problem, it said x equals uh, pi. Well, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't catch that uh, when I was doing the problem. Uh, so this is uh, I thought it said x, and so I went with that. Um, so this is. This is the re the relationship or the the value that you would expect to see. Okay, uh, so again, starting uh, starting with the graph here, uh, this is at pi over two, and this is at pi. We're rotating this region around this vertical, and so this is going to recall require us for cylindrical shells. Another way to notice that is that when your rectangle that you form is parallel to the axis of rotation, um, that's when you know you're going to use cylindrical shells. If the rectangle is perpendicular perpendicular to it, uh, like it was in the first one, then uh, you know it's either washers or, or disks. Okay, um, so finding out then the volume for this, if we move over here, uh, you can see, okay, over here you can see that we have 2 pi uh, times pi minus x. So what is this? This is the width, this is the width of the 
of this sheet if I was to unravel it. In other words, it's the distance from this point. I was considering how I would go all the way around this 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 cylindrical shell, which is kind of hard to see from that angle. So it's from starting here. The width is the is how if I was to unravel that shell. What would the distance of that rectangle be? Okay, so remember that if you take a uh, this is like a sheet of paper that you roll up, uh, and so this would be the the width of the paper. In other words, it would be how long is the paper, um, and so that's the it's from this point. I'm tracking along. It's imagine I'm walking along this original top line here, and coming all the way back around. So how far would that be? Well, that distance would be um, where am I at? Okay, from my axis of rotation, and so my perpendicular distance. Well, if my if my coordinate system set up with my origin here. This distance is x, but my axis of rotation is from over here at pi, uh, at pi. So the distance I'm actually rotating is the distance of the difference of those two, pi minus x, which is why uh, we have a pi minus x over here in the formula. Okay, so that's the that's the distance, and depending on where I'm at, right, depending on where I've moved x to, that will shrink or lengthen the distance of this of this width. Okay, so that's where that term's coming from. And then uh, the height of the rectangle that is being swept out is determined by the cosine function. That's what's generating the bounded region. Okay, uh, so this is what's generating the bounded region, this height here, which is why there's a cosine x in here. And then the width, or the depth, if you will, of the of the rectangle is what's determining the volume of that particular shell. And so that's what we that's what the method of shells does in integrating this over uh, the region. The bounded region is from zero to pi over two. So we have uh, pi, 2 pi, here we have 2 pi squared, that's this first integral, and distributing this inside is cosine x, so this is that first integral minus, and then over here we have 2 pi times minus x times cosine, which is the minus 2 x cosine x evaluated. So uh, I, I broke it up this way because each of these integrals is easier integrated individually. Um, and so this one is a simple straight integral, the antiderivative of cosine is sine, and so you have 2 pi squared sine of x evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. Sine of x, sine of 0 is 0, so pi of, sine of pi over 2 is, is just 1, so it's just 2 pi squared. Okay, and then over here, uh, we had to do a little bit more. Uh, we had to do an integration by parts um, to fully establish this one. So x cosine x dx, that's the integrand. Um, if you let u equal x and dv equal cosine x dx, then du will be dx and v, the integral or antiderivative of cosine is sine. Uh, which gives us uv here, and then we have the integral of sine. The integral of sine, of course, has an antiderivative of a negative sine, which makes that a positive here. Okay, and if we evaluate this between 0 and pi over 2, uh, you get pi over 2 times 1 minus 0, and then plus cosine of pi over 2 is 0, cosine of 1 is 1, so you get minus 1 here, which works out really well when you plug it back in, which is what I'm showing here. Uh, you're going to get uh, the result of uh, pi squared coming from the 2 pi, and a uh, plus 2 pi, okay? A minus, that should be a minus there, um, which is what you see here, okay? So this is a minus plus the, the 2 pi, I guess I didn't write that in. That's carrying it down, so that's 2 pi squared, minus pi squared, the 2 pi squared, minus pi squared, plus 2 pi, which gives us then uh, pi squared plus 2 pi, which then can be simplified, factoring out that common factor of pi there. All right, all right, so that is the result for problem one. All right, uh, in problem two, uh, we're asked to consider the function y equals one minus x squared uh, on the region from zero to one. And what we're gonna do with this is we're asked to find the centroid uh, for this particular problem. So just kind of a little background on what a centroid is. Uh, so the centroid for us uh, is really gonna be a, like a moment uh, for this function, okay? So um, the book usually denotes it as mx, uh, which is the integral uh, y times the um, the region in which the mass is, is centered, uh, and mx is going to be then the corresponding um, relationship with respect to x over the region, and then the total mass would be the the, re the volume, or the, the I guess it doesn't have to be a volume, um, would be the, the accumulation of all the individual masses, adding them all up. Uh, and so the center of mass is the, is the amount in the y direction times, uh, or divided by the total. Um, I really 
think that this gets a, a complicated or unnecessarily difficult to understand kind of a meaning to this. Uh, this is really no, these are no different than an average. These are really a, a no different than uh, an average value uh, in a sense. They're not quite the same, but they're pretty close. And so, and what I mean by that is that um, if you look at the, the, this is the, the top is the, is amount in that direction, if you will, the amount in that direction. So it's kind of vague, but um, that's because this can fit into a variety of circumstances. And the bottom is the total amount. Okay, so this is really like, okay, so how much of the Y is there? Uh, how much is it contributing to the overall amount? So if you think of it as like a balancing thing, which is exactly what this is, it's the relative comparison of how much does, does X contribute to the total amount and how much does Y contribute to the total amount? Okay, so this is really nothing more than an average, even though it's dressed up to be something um, which is quite frankly pretty confusing and oftentimes um, treated as such an esoteric piece. But if we can look at the form of this and recognize that this is just an average divided by the total, or sorry, let me say it this way, is how much is in that direction divided by the total? How much is in this direction by the, divided by the total? Okay. In other words, how much is this contributing? Um, a, one way, a simple way to think about this is, let's say that you stand on the scale holding um, another heavy object, like let's say you pick up a, a, a 20 pound weight and you, okay? So the total of you, the total here would be you plus a 20 pounds. And if you wanted to know how much you were contributing, then you would step back on the scale without the 20 pound weight and that would be your weight divided by the total weight of you and the 20 pound. Does that make sense? So this is how much you're contributing versus the total amount, which would be you and the 20 pound weight. So you can see that uh, individual contribution to the total is really what this is, is what this is measuring. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and figure that out. So we only need to find the x coordinate for the centroid in this situation. Um, so let's start by finding the individual total mass, okay? And so the uh, region of mass that's giving us uh, for this problem is from 0 to 1. Uh, and we're going to integrate the function uh, over that entire region. So uh, this is going to be the integral of 1, which is x, the integral of x squared, which is x cubed over 3. And then we're going to evaluate it at the limits of integration. So we get 1 minus a third, which is 2 thirds. So the total mass for this problem, or for this region, is 2 thirds. Okay. And then coming back over here, uh, we find that the contribution of x uh, in this situation, it's going to be x times the uh, function, 1 minus x squared dx. This is how we figure out the total mass, if you will. Uh, so distributing in the x and integrating get x times 1, x times x squared, x and then x cubed. Integrating get x squared over 2, and you get x to the fourth over 4. And the limits of integration being 1 to 0, the, t uh, the bottom one, 0, cancels out, and you're just left with 1 half minus 1, okay? Uh, which is, of course, 1 fourth. So finally then, to determine the total amount, all you need to do is come over here and take your contribution in the x direction divided by the uh, total amount, which is 1 fourth divided by 2 thirds, uh, which allows us then to reciprocate this, which is 3 halves, so it's 1 fourth times 3 halves, 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 2 is 8, and so the x coordinate uh, for the centroid would be at 3 over 8. All right? I hope that was helpful, and I'll see you in the next problem. All right, in uh, question three, uh, we're given that the uh, power series approximation, or not approximation, sorry, it's actually an exact value, uh, for this function cosine of x squared is given by uh, 1 minus uh, x to the fourth over 2 factorial plus x to the eighth over 4 factorial um, minus x to the twelfth over 6 factorial plus so on and so forth. And this is, and we're told this is valid for all real numbers. Okay, uh, so in part A, we're asked to use this uh, expansion for the first three terms uh, to to approximate this, the antiderivative of this, or the the integral of this. Okay, and so what it's asking us to do is integrate the first three terms. So we're going to look at these three terms um, and come back. We'll come back to the fourth term here in a minute. Okay, so integrating each of these three terms, uh, term by term. It's x, it's x to the fifth divided by two, and uh, these numbers come from evaluating the factorials. So if you're wondering where did the numbers come from in the denominator, it's just a result of uh, carrying out the 
multiplication in the factorial. So it's x minus x to the fifth over 10 plus an x to the ninth over 216. Okay, and so part A is pretty straightforward. Uh, part B, number three, then is asking us to approximate the area under the curve. Uh, given this, so since we've evaluated the integral in part A, part B is really just taking that result and using the limits of integration. Uh, since the x, each of them has an x, the lower limit doesn't need to be calculated because that's just all going to be zero. So it's really just results in plugging in 0.9 for each of those values. Uh, plugging that into the calculator, uh, you get that it's uh, 0.8427. Um, it didn't say anything around to four decimal places, which is why uh, this has been truncated at the fourth decimal place. Uh, so that is the that is the the value of which. Um, Okay, so just plugging in uh, 0.9 into each of those using the calculator and getting this out as a result, rounding to the fourth decimal place. Okay, uh, in part three, or part C, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more involved. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that particular problem. And so it says, um, if this is asking us to use the, the alternating series estimation theorem, um, which says that um, if the sequence, if the alternating series converges, then the absolute value of the remainder is less than or is equal to uh, S, the series sum, minus the nth derivative or nth um, partial sum that you're looking at. That's got to be less than or equal to um, the first neglected term, a to the n here, to the n plus 1 is the first neglected term. Okay, uh, so for our situation, I think I have it here. Let's go back up for just a second. So for our situation, remember, we were given the first four terms. We were given the first four terms. Uh, so we, we truncated our sequence at this point. And so this is our first neglected term. This is our a to the n plus 1, if you will. So x to the 12th over 6 factorial uh, and the minus sign of that. Okay, so this is the term that we'll be using for part c. Okay, coming back up here. Um, so this is their term is the size. Uh, okay, so then if we have that, that is the case. The absolute value of that, um, <clears throat> we can just assume that it's going to be positive. Uh, so that takes care of this. Uh, we integrate that x to the 12th becomes x to the 13 divided by 13. So it's going to be x to the 13 over 13 times 6 factorial. And then plugging in 0.9 uh, for the lower limit of integration. That will give us then plugging in that number in 0.9 to the 13th divided by 13 times divided by 6 factorial. Uh, this number, whatever it comes out to be, this number, whatever it comes out to be, will then be the um, the bound on the error for our approximation. Okay, I hope that was helpful and I'll see you in the next video. All right, uh, this problem um, has quite a paragraph setting it up. Um, it is very similar to many of these, this type of problem. And I think probably the most um, difficult part is is uh, in just the keeping track of numbers and stuff like that. So um, so the setup for this problem is you have a, we have a tank here and what's novel about this problem is that in this case normally the, the density is is a constant uh, but this density actually uh, varies with depth and so the, the way that it varies with depth is uh, x plus 32 quantity squared. So x plus 32 quantity the whole thing squared um, has a density of cube uh, in kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, uh, one thing to note in the paragraph setup is that they set it up with the x value um, being, and we normally would call that maybe y. Uh, the x value here is, the origin is set up so that it is um, at the top of the tank and it's pointing down, so that's considered positive. Okay, um, all right, so that just changes. You just got to be careful about how that orientates uh, for the different types of problems. Okay, so uh, we're talking about work for this problem. So we need to know um, we're going to have a force times some distance. So we got to figure out uh, what's the force acting and uh, over what distance it's moving. Okay, that's really all these problems boil down to. So uh, if I have this sort of setup, so the, the tank has a three meter radius and it's five, or sorry, it's five meters tall. Okay, so this is just some arbitrary uh, height, um, some arbitrary height x uh, down in the in the um, in the tank. Okay, and so if we zoom that in a little bit, what we see is that this, this little hockey puck of volume here uh, has a radius of three. So that's what I call r naught. It's a constant, 
um, and then it's it's depth right so the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times height the height is dx and then this is the area of the, of the top of the hockey puck which is pi r squared this is a constant it doesn't vary with height um, so it's just r squared which is three okay uh, all right so then the force on the hockey puck is the f g g is given to us as 9.8 meters per second squared um, times the, the differential volume. Uh, this comes from the fact that uh, the density, this is a fluid density, and so um, a fluid force, so it's going to be rho GV, uh, where, but this is the differential volume because this is it varies with height, so we need to know as it moves. All right, so um, then the work done is going to be the distance x that the hockey puck is moved through, uh, and it's going to be, it's completely full, the tank is completely full, so the volume is going to be from 0 to, pi, zero to 5. Um, and then we have g pi r pi r naught squared times x plus 32 uh, quantity squared times x. This is this right here is the force. This right here is the distance, and then the sum of those is what's happening here. Okay. All right. Uh, so to integrate this, um, to integrate this the setup, uh, I don't like to have to like foil this out, and there's lots of challenges with that. So um, I like to make a u sub here. So I make I let u equal x plus 32, um, and then changing the limits of integration, I have u of 30, zero, u of 0 is 32, and u of 5 is 37. Um, du is equal to dx, so this is a really nice substitution. Um, the other thing is, is it allows me then to move uh, to move this in for x, so I can replace this x with uh, u minus 32, and it allows me to not have to worry about the um, factoring this thing out, so this just becomes u squared. Okay, and so that makes it the integration really nice because then I can I can just distribute in the u squared into each term. So I get u cubed minus 32 u squared. Integrating, I get uh, u to the fourth over four minus 32 uh, over three u cubed, um, and then I have nine pi and g. G is a constant. Nine is a constant. G. And I don't really care about the constants uh, and per se to uh, to the final part. Okay, uh, so evaluating the integral, I get 37 minus 32. So I did that in uh, in GeoGebra, and it gave me 5, 6, 2, 4, 9, uh, 2, 5 pi over 4 g newton meters. So um, if you plug in 9.8 and pi, you would get a different number. So your numbers may vary here, depending on if you evaluated the constants or not. Um, I think if you plug everything in, uh, and keeping out decimals, I think the final result is 441727 newton meters is the amount of work actually needed to uh, remove this fluid uh, or pump the fluid out of the tank. Okay, all right, I hope that was helpful and I'll see you in the last video. All right, uh, in this problem, uh, what we're looking at is two parts. So part A is asking us to consider uh, this, this function, this integral, uh, but instead of evaluating it directly, he wants us to use uh, the midpoint rule with a sub, with two sub intervals. Okay, so uh, the graph of this is a uh, is a hyperbola, a hyperbola, is hyperbola, uh, but it's it's not um, it's axis of or its vertical asymptote is over here at negative one. In other words, that's the value when the denominator is equal to zero. So for our region between zero and one, this function is continuous and beautiful, and we can use whatever we need to. All right, uh, since we're only creating two rectangles, then. Um, the distance between 0 and 1, um, the midpoint for this would be then at x equals a half, okay? Um, so that would be where the two rectangles would be split up. But we also know that the, since we're using the midpoint uh, rule, then we need to know the height of the midpoint. Well, this region here is from 0 to uh, 0.5, so the midpoint is, is 0.25. And this region, the midpoint is between 0.5 and 1, so the midpoint of that one is 0.75. Uh, if you don't remember how to find it and you have, or you're concerned about like, well, what about a not so nice situations? Mid, the midpoint is just a plus b over 2, where a and b doesn't necessarily have to be the region of your domain. Um, it could be uh, there the, the endpoints that we're talking about here. Okay. Uh, so for the overall, this one is 0 plus 1, which is over 2, which is why it's a half. Um, okay. All right. Uh, so these are the two heights, then, for our approximation. Uh, and so this is literally just this rectangle. What is the height of this rectangle? Um, or what is the area of this rectangle plus what is the area of this rectangle? Okay. 
Uh, so um, that's what we're talking about down here. Let me see if I can push this under a little bit. There we go. And slide that over. Okay. So this integral is equal to the base times height of the first rectangle plus base times height of the second rectangle. Okay. So the height, uh, the base is that one half. The height is, is the value of that, that one half. So it's one half plus one over 0.25. And then B is the same thing, but the second one. So it's one half. That's the base. It's a base of one half. And then the midpoint is at 0.75. So this is that result. Uh, simplifying uh, fractions out, the exact value is 34 over, uh, or 24 over 37, 35, oh my gosh, I can't read, uh, is 24 over 35, which just comes from uh, simplifying the fraction, uh, which is about 0 0.69 which, to two decimal places. Okay, all right, so that's part A, and then part B, part B wanted us to um, notice that the it's wanting us to find a bound on this, or how many terms do we need uh, in the subinterval? Uh, so it gives us the relationship for in part B to determine the error. So how how do we know what is the error on this thing? And so let's go and kind of pull that out and see what happens here. So in part B, it uh, gives us that the absolute value of the second derivative has to be is bounded by some some value called they call k. And the error then is going to be less than or equal to that, that second derivative value k, the maximum of that, uh, divided by the difference in the uh, endpoints cubed, uh, divided by, I said divided earlier, sorry, it's the maximum second derivative of that function. So what is it, whatever it is on that region, times the difference of the endpoints cubed, all divided by uh, 24 times n squared. n is the number of rectangles. Okay, and this is actually what we're after. This is what we're trying to figure out. So we wanted the error uh, to be no less than 10 to the minus 5. Okay, uh, so setting this setting up the problem first, we have we have our our error term, this thing here. Um, I guess I can do it up here. We want this to be less than or equal to 10 to the minus 5. So we're trying to figure out how many n's do I need to make this happen. Okay, uh, well if we first we need to calculate k. So the second derivative of our function f um, is this thing, and I use GeoGebra to calculate that, x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. So that's the second derivative of this. And then the maximum value of k occurs at an endpoint, which happens to be on the left endpoint. So this is going to be the maximum value there, and that's going to be 2. Okay, so this is our maximum value of the, of the value. So that's our k. And then our difference in the uh, limits of integration, so or enter difference in the interval, b is 1 and a is 0. So this is really nice. It's just 1 squared, which is 1. So this is 1 half, or not 1 half, this is 2 over 24 n squared times 10. So then now it's just a matter of uh, simplifying and solving. So I move the n squared over here, and then uh, think if you think about it as like reciprocating, um, you get 10 to the fifth. Uh, divided by 12 is got to be so n squared's got to be greater than this number, or this number is. Uh, so n squared, or sorry, uh, taking the square root gives us what n is. So 10 to the fifth divided by 12. Uh, the square root of that is a roughly 91 point something. So we need n to be greater than or equal to 92 in order to uh, in order to actually simplify this out. So. Just kind of coming down here for a little, for a second. Sorry, I was pointing at it and didn't realize I wasn't looking at it. Uh, so just simplifying, um, the one and the the two and the twelve can twenty four can be reduced here, uh, and then I move the n squared over, and then I, I multiply both sides by like the ten to the fifth, um, and so that brings that ten to the fifth divided by twelve is less than or equal to no, it's strictly less than n squared, and then uh, we take the square root, we get that this is roughly ninety one which means that uh, we need n to be greater than or equal to 92 to guarantee that our result is at least, um, it's gonna be at least less than 10 to the minus fifth uh, in accuracy, okay? All right, I hope that was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.